Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again on Living History. I'm your host, Matt McLaughlin, and thanks for all the feedback you've been giving us lately, uh, through, especially through our social media channels, through Facebook and Twitter in particular. Uh, lots of great stuff coming through there and um, good suggestions for podcasts as well. And, uh, and, and some of these podcasts we're doing lately have come off the back of those suggestions. So if you've got thoughts for, a, for, a, for an interesting podcast subject, do always let us know or just send us questions and comments. Our episode this week is going to be a pretty special one. It's uh, It's been the anniversary of D-Day uh, and always a popular topic in military history. But one of the, the, the facets of it that I think gets overlooked is people think Australians weren't involved and that's absolutely not the case. And we did a podcast on this a couple of years ago uh, and we talked about the extensive involvement of the Australians in D-Day. And indeed, we should not talk just about D-Day. We should talk about uh, all of the operations in Normandy because the Australian involvement was quite extensive. And we're going to revisit that topic today around the time of the anniversary. Uh, and my uh, my guest today is someone that uh, has been on the podcast a couple of times before uh, and knows this topic, the Australian involvement in, in the operations in Normandy, better than I'd say anyone. And uh, it's, uh, it's Lachlan Grant from the Australian War Memorial. Lachlan, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for having me on. So we're going to talk today specifically, uh, you know, there's so many topics. Before the interview, mate, we were throwing around ideas for a whole range of topics we could talk about. It's actually, in spite of what people think, it's actually a very broad topic, the Australian involvement in D-Day and, and the Normandy operation. So we're going to talk specifically about the RAAF involvement, the Air Force involvement, because that was the um, the major part of the uh, of the operations uh, in Normandy. So it's going to be a great topic. Before we get there, let's talk about you and the work that you're doing there at the War Memorial. Uh, a lot of change is going on at the War Memorial at the moment, and you're in the thick of it. So uh, just tell us a little bit about what you do there and uh, and the work that you've been doing lately. Absolutely, Matt. Um, I'm a senior historian at the, the War Memorial, and at the minute, my job, I'm uh, leading the team that's doing the new Australians in Bomber Command display for Anzac Hall, which, of course, will be centred around our famous Lancaster G for George. So G for George will be going back on display after the um, development. It'll be going back into the new Anzac Hall with a brand new exhibition. We'll be telling a lot of new stories. Uh, a lot of the objects we've identified for this display are objects that have come into the collection in the last sort of five or six years. So these are stories that we haven't told before in the galleries. Um, and of course, we're also working on the other First World War, Second World War displays that are really iconic. Those um, uh, classic objects such as the submarine from Sydney Harbour, redoing that display. We're doing a new Australians in the Battle of Milne Bay display, which will fo feature the P-40 Kitty Hawk and the Hargo tank, and they'll be brought together into the galleries in the same spot uh, for the very first time to help reinterpret the, the Battle of Milne Bay. And then the other one we're working on is uh, the Sydney Emden battle from the First World War. There's a lot of good stuff going on there, mate. I mean, it, uh, you know, it's it's been slightly controversial the redevelopment of the War Memorial. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, like things the way they are. And uh, what, paint us a picture. What's the experience going to be like? How is it going to be enhanced for people once uh, once all these works are finished? Well, the key objective to the development is really creating new galleries for all those Australians who served in peacekeeping humanitarian operations across the last sort of 70, 80 years since the end of the Second World War but also putting in uh, proper gallery space for um, those veterans of the recent conflicts, so conflicts in the Middle East, in Iraq, uh, Syria, and of course in Afghanistan. And so those veterans, when they've come to the memorial in the past, there's only been very small parts of the memorial telling their story, but these will be given adequate gallery space that are sort of on par with the other, other conflicts we cover in the memorial, those First World War, Second World War galleries, so pro proper permanent gallery space for, for those conflicts. And, for those veterans and their families to come and visit. It's an interesting one, isn't it? The, 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 the memorial has always had large numbers of veterans obviously coming through. And I think Charles Bean's original vision when he first, you know, during the First World War, when he first came up with this concept for a, a wonderful memorial museum back in Australia, I think part of the story, part of the thing he wanted to do was was make it approachable for people who weren't there. He was surrounded by tens of thousands of veterans who'd lived through that experience of the First World War. And so I think the role of the memorial has always been to help explain the, 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 you know, our war history to people who didn't live through it. How do you find it as a, as a historian there at the memorial now that those veterans are no longer with us? You know, we, you still are doing, 
amazing displays about the First World War. We have no First World War veterans left. You're doing, as you just discussed, as we're going to talk about today, incredible uh, displays and, 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 and artifacts associated with World War II, even though the numbers of veterans from World War II is diminishing. Do you think the role of the War Memorial is changing? As uh, Are we taking over from telling those stories now that there's no veterans around to do it themselves? Uh, so you dropped out a little bit there, but I think you're talking about the changing nature of the memorial over over the years as we get further away from the First and Second World War. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, of course, our, our brief is to also tell the stories of um, all Australians who served in the forces in, in conflict and peacekeeping humani humanitarian operations. So we need to come up with um, a proper ways to, to display and, and represent their service. But the way that we will be doing it is essentially very similar to what we've done uh, with those World War galleries. And it'll be through uh, the objects telling the stories, um, the large technology objects, um, they're not just big, big pieces of equipment. Um, you know, G for George represents, for example, hundreds of Australian, British, Canadian, New Zealand servicemen who flew, flew on it. And through its display, we're able to tell um, hundreds of individual stories. So it's through telling those individual and personal stories. Uh, we're still very much committed to telling those um, First and Second World War stories um, as uh, you know, there are over 100,000 names on the Roll of Honour from both those world wars. And through the research we're doing, um, particularly uh, I've mentioned my, my focus has been on Bomber Command. I mean, we're discovering new stories every day, um, new pieces in the collection. Um, and as I mentioned, the new, new Bomber Command uh, display will be featuring hundreds of objects that um, haven't before been on display. Yeah, it's exciting stuff, mate. Well, let's talk about our topic for today, which is uh, not just the RAAF, because a lot of Australian uh, flyers served with the RAF as well, the, the British Royal Air Force. Um, the story today is about what Australians did in the air over Normandy, because this was our greatest contribution to the Normandy campaign. Can you give us a little bit of an overview for people who didn't uh, listen to the last episode or people who don't know? Give us a little bit of an overview of the Australian contribution, because I know it was a topic that, well, really, until I started talking to you about it, I, I had no idea of the extent of, Austra of Australian involvement in D-Day and in the Normandy campaign. So just give us an overview of that Australian involvement. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I mean, it's a, a really diverse story, for, for one thing, um, and it's been a... I guess a hard story for historians to tell over the years and that's one of the reasons that it's not well recognised that um, there was a, an Australian contribution and there were so many Australians involved and that's because there's not that many Australian units involved. There are some Royal Australian Air Force units but there's no infantry divisions on the ground um, and usually uh, for a historian it's easy to tell the story of a force by following the story of, of the division but the nature of the Second World War is um, hundreds and uh, well, thousands actually of Australian airmen, uh, hundreds of Australian sailors uh, serving on attachment in the Royal Navy, in the Royal Air Force. And so they're spread across the British forces as individuals. So these are very much often individual Australian stories serving within um, other Commonwealth units. And um, finding who those individuals are and then finding their story is, is very much the challenge. But it's a uh, Huge, diverse story. Um, I'll give you some numbers. About 3,300 Australians served on 6th of June, involved in the D-Day landings, uh, and many more served throughout the campaign because it's not just the 6th of June. There's a, there's a build-up period, and then there's the, the campaign itself, which lasts until August. About 2,800 of those Australians uh, on D-Day itself were serving in the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, and there's another 10,000 Australian airmen in Britain at that time who are in the reserve pool. And as the casualties mount through the campaign, those guys are going into those frontline squadrons. And to give you an example, Australians are serving across uh, a couple of hundred different Royal Air Force squadrons. As I mentioned, they're serving not just in those Australian Royal Australian Air Force squadrons, they're serving in RAF squadrons as well. Some of them are in Canadian squadrons, some are in New Zealand squadrons. So it's very much a Commonwealth war effort and Australians are sort of spread throughout the Commonwealth Air Force under the banner of the Royal Air Force. And they're flying all types of aircraft. They're flying uh, Dakotas, uh, dropping paratroopers, uh, Stirlings dropping paratroopers, uh, Lancaster flying bombers, Lancasters, your Halifaxes, you know, Typhoons, Spitfires, um, you know, all the types of aircraft that have been deployed, um, there's Australians in almost all the squadrons um, doing, doing their thing. Uh, 
It's a fascinating story, and we always, as military historians, have to create that distinction between the individuals who served um, and the units that they served with. And it, sometimes it blurs, doesn't it? Even if we're talking about the story of Gallipoli or the First World War, we talk about the Australians, and we know that about thirty percent of the of the of the of the men who served with the Australian forces were actually born in Britain. So it's it's always really essential that we create that distinction. I think it's something you're doing very well by uncovering these stories of individuals because as important as it is to know what the units were doing and where they were and who they were representing, um, I think the reason we all know and love this stuff is because of the, those individual stories. So um, let's talk about what sort of what sort of missions were the, 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 the flyers, you know, Bomber Command, the Australians who were flying both with Australian squadrons and with British squadrons, what sort of missions were they carrying out in the lead up to D-Day? Well, at the end of what was called the Battle of Berlin period, which wound up at the end of March uh, 1944, Bomber Command was then essentially assigned to General Eisenhower, which was the American commander in charge of all of the Allied forces uh, in Britain in preparation for the invasion and uh, in, with Shafe headquarters. Uh, and Bomber Command was deployed to help prepare for the invasion of France. And this preparation period across April and May was essentially bombing railway targets across um, France and Belgium and, and Germany and to destroy bridges for start um, and to destroy railway yards. And this was to cut off the Normandy area from the rest of France. So it would be very difficult for German railway stock to resupply their troops in Normandy to get uh, particular panzer tanks to the front line because the, they, would, they would move across France, across Germany on railway wagons. So it was destroying railway stock, destroying the railways, destroying the railway bridge, bridge crossings across rivers. And this essentially cut off Normandy from the rest of France. And it was quite a successful uh, campaign, but it was also quite a, quite a dangerous campaign too. I mean, many, many Australians were losing their lives in these missions. In fact, many, when I say many Australians, many airmen in Bomber Command were losing their lives in these missions. So, uh, railway junctures were heavily defended with flak. There was a lot of night fighter activity um, as there were when they were bombing over German cities. So casualties still remained high, even though they'd moved away from these targets such as Berlin or the Ruhr Valley area. I read in an article that you wrote recently, mate, that the in that lead-up period to D-Day, the casualties were actually higher in uh, the European theatre for Australians than they were in the Pacific, which is uh, which is extraordinary. Absolutely, and that's one of the um, that's why I think one of the most uh, things that I've found most surprising in the research I've done on this period is it is this period from April to August 1944, which is actually the highest casualties for the Royal Australian Air Force across the whole war. And even in this period, as you mentioned, the the figures um, and the amount of Australians who are buried in in graves uh, commemorated. On memorials across Europe for this period is more than uh, com commemorated in, say, New Guinea in this period, where we sort of think of Australia's war in 1944 and this late period of the war. Very much you think of the fighting in places like New Guinea and Bougainville, but Australians were, were very much in the thick of it um, in the skies above Europe. When we talk about great battles, and D-Day is a good example of it, we tend to be very focused we in the general public tend to be very focused on the infantry involvement. There's just something, you know, understandable and visceral about the thought of men you know, taking up arms and fighting against each other. Do you find it frustrating as a historian that that incredible amount of work that was done in the skies and on the seas to support the Normandy operation of, you know, and if it didn't occur, the Normandy operation wouldn't have occurred at all. Uh, is it frustrating that, it, uh, that, that so much focus seems to fall on just the infantry involvement? I wouldn't say I wouldn't I wouldn't find it frustrating myself because I, I I very much enjoy reading and looking and discovering all of the stories. But it's part of part of the work here is um it's always amazing that we're still discovering these new stories. And as I mentioned, that these Australians who are serving as individuals across Europe, you keep discovering new ones all the time. And and there's one that collection um in in, in the memorial which I came across by a typhoon pilot. His name was uh, Herbert Copeman. He first started flying typhoons during the Battle of Normandy and um, after his first op, he wrote down uh, that he didn't think he would survive another operation. He just thought it was so dangerous. He'd flown alongside his wing commander and um, the casualties were, were so high. And he said that um, by the, at the end of the war in VE Day, he survived the war. He flew all the way through to VE Day. 
and at VE Day they were having a celebration of the, the Allied victory and he looked around the room and he realised that he was the only pilot from Normandy who was still with, with the squadron. And he had some amazing stories of just how difficult it was being a Typhoon pilot. They were firing at low ground targets, supporting the, the infantry on the ground, um, often targeting tanks or flak positions. And with the... Um, with the typhoon, they'd come in um, so fast and pull out so quick. The G-force was so strong. Copeman often talked about blacking out for a few seconds in the cockpit when they were pulling out of that dive. And he said that was the scariest part because when you came out of the dive, the Germans were putting their heads up and started shooting back at him. And on one occasion, a 88 millimeter round put a hole through his wing and it caused the fuel um, to mix with his oxygen flow. And so he got a face full of aviation fuel and it. so he's trying not to pass out in the cockpit, trying to open the cockpit while coming out of this dive and trying desperately not to actually pass out because that would obviously cause him to, to crash his typhoon. And so casualties, we often think talk about Bomber Command, but uh, casualties across the all of the Air Force in Europe is about one in five, one in five Australians killed. In Bomber Command, it's more than one in three, but across all the forces, it's one in five. So. It's still a very dangerous job for those Spitfire pilots and Typhoon pilots who are engaging in that um, close ground attack role. How important were these missions, Lockie, in the overall success of uh, of the Normandy campaign? Oh, air power was huge. It was a major factor in the Allied success. The uh, German Air Force had uh, copped up so much damage, particularly from the American air raids on um, Germany in this early period of 1944. And they'd done hu huge damage to the German fighter force um, defending the German skies. And so the Germans weren't able to deploy um, as many fighters in the Normandy area as what um, they would obviously have liked. And this, this allowed the, um, the Allies to have dominance of the air and supporting uh, the ground operations with the Air Force. And as I mentioned, those Typhoon Spitfires uh, hitting those targets close to the front line, um, supporting the infantry played a huge role. But even in some of the big battles um, to help with the breakout of Normandy, um, Bomber Command would be called in to bomb concentrations of German positions. Uh, there's also another famous Australian squadron involved um, in Normandy, 464 Squadron Flying Mosquitoes, and their role was to um, to intercept and help delay a German SS Panzer Division, which was making its way from southern France up to Normandy, and it, it's almost day-by-day -day basis was trying to um, hamper and delay the, this SS Division from, from getting to the front lines. Just extraordinary stuff. It's really boys' own adventure stuff, isn't it? What was the range of aircraft that Australians were flying at this time? Because we, again, we think we tend to just think of them as you know flying Lancasters or Bomber Command or maybe the occasional Spitfire pilot. But it's quite extraordinary when you see just just how many different types of aircraft and how many different types of missions the Australians were operating. Yeah, well, one of the um, one of the forgotten group of Australian airmen are, are those who are flying the um, paratroopers into Normandy, and they're flying a range of aircraft uh, such as. Uh, Dakotas, they're flying Stirlings and flying uh, Albemarles. And they, they're dropping the British 6th Airborne Division uh, onto um, onto what the famous Pegasus Bridge uh, and dropping gliders as well. And those guys working really hard. Uh, one pilot whose account I was reading, Ron Minchin, he flew three missions in the 24 hours of D-Day. So he flew the first parachute drop. So, you know, they're some of the first guys over Normandy dropping the British paratroopers shortly after midnight then he's uh, back again dropping uh, gliders later that morning and then uh, in the afternoon dropping supplies so three missions in the one day so they talk about the longest day uh, for guys like Ron Minchin um, and the other pilots of 196 squadron flying those Stirlings and and other airborne forces in um, you know three three missions in one day over over the Normandy battlefields. Just extraordinary stories, and you're, you've you've specialised in telling these stories over the years. I, I, I don't know if I've ever asked you, Lockie, but did you actually ever meet any of these veterans and hear their stories firsthand, or has it all been from archives that you've, you've learned about them? I've met a couple of veterans who visited the memorial over the years, but um, I've been at the memorial for about 10 years now, and, and sadly we don't get too many Second World War veterans coming through through um, the doors visiting anymore due to the age. I mean, many of these, these guys who are still around would be nearing 100, so... Um, and there's not many, not many left. So usually it's through discovering the stories I'm coming across. It's through discovering papers in our collections, 
um, uncovering uh, Royal Australian Air Force collections, uh, official records in the National Archives, uh, where some of these stories have been recorded. And um, and yeah, and, and sort of so we're going back to the old source in a sense of um, uncovering these stories from what was written at the time. Well, you must have uncovered some pretty fascinating stories, and I know in our last podcast we talked about a few of them, but we've got a, we've got some more that have, have come to light. What what are some of the stories that are just the most engaging that you've come across? Well, there's um, one of the most dangerous things for the airmen in, in Normandy is um, when once they are shot down. I mean, for for a Lancaster crew, um, it could be a crew of seven, and when they get shot down, um, sometimes there only be one survivor, and, and that's could be traumatic enough for the one who survives the action. But then there's a time on the ground where they're trying to evade capture because they're being mostly shot down over German positions. Um, and so they're being shot down behind their friendly lines. And so they've either got, if it's before the landings, they've got to try and make their way and try and get back out of occupied Europe, back to uh, Britain and rejoin their squadrons. And some of them actually managed to do that. Um, others uh, hide out hoping that the, um, the uh, the advance will, will come soon and they'll be able to rejoin their forces that way once um, once the Allied landings are successful and, and they move through the area in which which they're hiding, um, usually with you know, with the help of the French resistance in a safe house somewhere. Um, and others become prisoners of war and are sent um, off to prisoner of war camps in, in Germany and um, other parts of occupied Europe, which is now modern modern day Poland. I mean, one one of these stories of um, evasion, um, which uh, I've come across here at the memorial, and this is uh, through uh, researching one of our last post ceremony stories. Um, many of your listeners will be familiar with the last post ceremony that's held here each afternoon uh, to close the war memorial, where we tell the story of one of the individuals on the roll of honour. And a family member of this individual actually wrote into the memorial one day requesting that some. Um, his story be told. And uh, the gentleman in question was a, a guy named Flight Sergeant Stanley Black. Um, and he flew in 106 Squadron, which was a Lancaster Squadron. And, and he was shot down shortly after D-Day. And he was the only survivor of his of his Lancaster. And he managed to hook up with a group of um, members of the 82nd Airborne Division, the famous United States Airborne Division that had parachuted into Normandy on 6th of June. And he was with this group of 180 paratroopers who were to defend a small village called Grey Inn, which was on the road to Carentan. And there was a the 17th SS Panzer Division, Panzer Grenadier Division, was was approaching the village. And these 180 uh, paratroopers it was their job to try and hold them up for as long as possible. And we know that Stanley Black was with the uh, with these paratroopers during this battle. And when the Germans eventually um, overran the town, they'd been delayed for, for a number of days. All the, the survivors who were left were, were rounded up and executed by those SS troops. And Stanley Black's name appears on the memorial in that town alongside the names of all the American paratroopers and the local villagers who fought in, in the defence of, of Grey Inn. And uh, it's just one of those amazing stories of, um, of evasion and... Uh, and you know, he paid the ultimate price in, um, you know, in, in helping liberate uh, Western Europe from Nazism. It's just an extraordinary tale, that one. I mean, to, be, to have flown as a Lancaster crew member, to be shot down, to survive the crash, then to meet up with Americans, he must have thought, this is my lucky day, and then to find himself in the thick of the fighting against the, uh, the, the Germans and then to, to meet that ghastly end. I mean, mate, this is why it's so important, the work that you do telling these personal stories, because we can talk till we're blue in the face about various divisions moving around and high command and the, the plan for Normandy and how it all unfolded on the ground by looking at maps and reading accounts. But when you hear those personal stories, I mean, that that literally sent a chill down my spine as you told that story. What a, you know, what a, what a story worthy of being remembered. And the fact that until relatively recently, we weren't even aware of that story. Just, just extraordinary. You, do you get... Do you get a thrill when you uncover the, I mean, that's not quite the right word, but you know what I mean? It, it, it must be, I mean, I know you're a very good historian and you could remain clinically detached from these things, but there must be an emotional connection with these stories a lot of the time for you as well. Well, um, yeah, you're, you're right, Matt. And, and one thing that I've found, um, I've done quite a lot of work on, on prisoners of war experience and Australian prisoner of war experience. And when I was doing that work, you realise that, um, you know, the 22,000 prisoners of the Japanese and the 8,000 prisoners of the Germans and Italians in the Second World War, they all have this uh, individual story and individual journey. And, 
it's very much the same for these airmen, um, Australian airmen who go on to serve in, in Europe as well. They have their own journey of when they enlist in Australia from where they come from and their own journey across the world. Some go through Canada, some go across the States or through the Panama Canal, some go to Rhodesia to do some of their training, but they all end up um, in England. And then, then they all end up in different squadrons. As I said, they end up in over 200 squadrons, all flying different types of aircraft. Um, you know, on and during a campaign like D, they all doing different activities. Uh, it could be photo reconnaissance, for example. It could be, you know, in bomber command. It could be dropping those paratroopers. Uh, it could be flying fighters. Um, could even be doing meteorological sort of, you know, work of flying out over the. Uh, over the Atlantic to get the weather reports ahead of D-Day. So, yeah, they're diverse stories and each of these individuals has their own own individual story. So when we when we find a new name and find a new story, it's often got its own um, own individual quirk to it that makes it different from any of the other stories we've found. So it does make it exciting because we often find, um, you know, each, each of them has their own story and, and there's always something unique. And what are some other stories you've come across, mate? Share those with us. Earlier, I mentioned uh, 464 Squadron flying mosquitoes uh, over over Normandy, and one of the um, one of the first Australians who probably died in the the Battle of Normandy. It's hard to specify who the very first is, for example, but someone who died early on in the actions on the night of 5th to 6th of June was um, Squadron Leader Arthur Oxlade, and he was flying a mosquito. It was shot down by a night fighter um, over over Normandy. And his navigator was a guy named Donald Shanks, and he survived and uh, parachuted down. And behind enemy lines, he was helped by the French resistance, and he, he dressed up as a sort of French peasant and went in disguise. But he was uh, stuck behind the lines for, for weeks on weeks. And as the German build-up in the area became, um, the, you know, became much stronger, he was often found, he was often in a farmhouse with other German soldiers around, and so he sort of had to play... Um, sort of uh, deaf and mute. It's, he claimed he'd lost his, or the, the French uh, uh, he was with claimed that he'd lost his hearing from uh, the bombing of Khan. But, and so anyway, he, he sort of played this role for a few weeks. Um, he, was even, he even observed um, B1s being launched um, at one, one stage. Uh, but he was able to make it back to the Allied lines and, um, and flew again. But, uh, and we have a photograph of him in the collection in his French present outfit. Um, looking very much like a, an Australian with a cheeky grin, just wearing the a French beret, which is a, it's quite an amusing photo, but a, quite an amazing story when you when you read the details of the story and how how he was in such a precarious situation for for such a period of time, but then to having lost his squadron leader and um, and fellow air crew, but then to to be back and flying later on in in the campaign um, is is another one of those amazing stories. Just extraordinary. I love some of those uh, those stories about uh, about airmen who were shot down and um, and, and managing to escape back to uh, back to the, the Allied lines, back to England in in, in many cases. Obviously, a little bit easy. I won't say easier, but uh, you know, it, it wasn't as big a challenge in 1944 because the front line was advancing. But some of those stories about guys that were shot down in you know 1941, 1942. <laughs> The war was a long way away, and uh, you know, trying to get back to England just uh, just uh, absolutely extraordinary stories. I mean, it's a little bit of a departure from what we're talking about, but but that must be, you know, th th those must be fascinating stories when you come across those as well. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, they're they're very much going to be part of our new exhibition. Some of those stories are of evasion in Europe, and very much we must remember the bravery of the the locals in, in the areas they shot down, the the Dutch and the Belgians and the French who who helped those individual airmen hide out initially after they'd been shot down. And then um, through the work of the French resistance to be funneled away and make their way across, often across the, the Spanish border into the Basque region of Spain, where they would um, make hook up with the British consulates in places like uh, San Sebastian or Bilbao, and um, then make their way back to England from there. But often they'd be missing from their squadrons for months, if not even longer. And so they'd be like a ghost walking in when they got back to their squadron because, um, you know, the, the members of the squadron often wouldn't expect to see them again because they'd be listed as missing in action. So their families, even back home in Australia, wouldn't know that they're still alive during this period. Um, they would have received a note that they were missing, um, often missing, presumed killed. Uh, and so, you know, to get that, imagine being at home, getting that news uh, maybe 12 months later that they're actually alive and and um, and 
you know, it would have been would have been great news for, for their families back home. But that's um that escape network, as I mentioned, the, the bravery of um of the locals in, in Belgium and France and the Netherlands helping helping those airmen who are shot down at such great risk for themselves. You know, they if uh, they were caught by a Gestapo or SS hiding airmen in that fashion, yeah, that would be put themselves or their families in grave danger. Yeah, just extraordinary stuff. Mate, how do we make sure that these stories are being told? How do we make sure that, a, you know, the younger generations who don't have any direct connection to the war, how, how are institutions like the Australian War Memorial making sure that the, the stories of these incredible heroic people, men and women, are being told? Well, one of the one of the things that we're trying to do with our methodology and our exhibitions is just show that they're real people living real lives. Um, you know, they they come from all parts of Australia and all backgrounds. You know, they were, could be teachers or uh, mechanics or farmers. Uh, you know, from from Mildura or from Wagga or um, you know any state or territory of Australia. So if a visitor comes in. Um, hopefully they'll get a connection that they're from, might be from a place where they come from or a place they know and telling the story about how they enlisted, spent two years training, um, joined up, but they're just using their own voices where we can as well, just showing their real people and their real stories. And that's the way we're trying to get a connection with um, particularly the younger audiences because, as you say, these things happen so, so long ago. But it's that personal connection, that personal touch, I think, that is the way that, the way that I think what well, I feel or, or we feel here is the best way of trying to to um, to engage with the um, with modern generations. Well, mate, you're doing a great job and uh, I can't wait to uh, to see the redevelopment of the War Memorial and see more of those stories being on display. Um, always a pleasure to catch up. I'm sure it won't be long before we have you on the show again. But uh, Lachlan Grant, thank you so much for your time today, mate. That was terrific. Thanks, Matt.